you'll be all right. One minute. All right, we're supposed to start this meeting at 9 o'clock. Any commissioners in the building, if you just make your way to the dais, it's one minute till 9. Yeah, can you, can you please, so we can call this thing to order? I need that Jeopardy music. <laughs> I wonder if I can find that. I'll play that. <laughs> All right, here we are. <clears throat> Morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. How are you doing, my friend? How are you, sir? As usual, you've got the killer jacket. <laughs> no, who else would do it? Other than I know, man. I know. All right, good morning, everyone. It's two minutes after nine. This is the Board of County Commissioners Committee of the Whole meeting, September 8th, 2022, two minutes after nine o'clock. Um, Please turn your cell phone to the silence or the offsetting. This is an opportunity for us to talk among ourselves with staff, so we will not have a public forum this morning. However, commissioners individually can call people up as necessary, and I do anticipate that that would happen. Now I'd like to ask that everyone please stand and join me in observing a moment of silence and then remain standing for us to do the pledge. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, has this meeting been properly advertised? Mr. Chairman, this meeting was advertised on September 1st, 2022 in the Escambia Sun Press in the board's weekly meeting schedule. Escambia Sun Press. Very, very yes, good. Sir. Thank you. Outstanding. We love the we love the Escambia Sun Press. All right. Board items. Discussion on coordinated opioid recovery. Wes, you're recognized to, to Thank you, Mr. Up. Chairman. I'll ask Eric Gilmore to come up and introduce uh, our guests today as they uh, come and bring a presentation to the board uh, regarding opioid recovery, uh, a special program instituted by the governor. 
Good morning, commissioners. Uh, this morning, we want to give you a presentation. Uh, back, I think it was early, like May or June of this year, uh, we received word that there was funding coming down to certain counties to receive money for uh, opioid crisis. Uh, since then, we've put together a committee. Uh, the groups met to meet uh, to understand the metrics and the, the uh, objectives of what we need to meet to pull that money down. And then, in August of third this year, Governor DeSantis announced uh, 12 counties that we are receiving this funding to help out with the opioid crisis. It's called the Core Program, and uh, Core Program stands for Coordinating uh, Opioid Recovery. And uh, I'm going to have Chief Torsell come up and give you guys a presentation uh, about what the program will do for us here in Escambia County. And uh, what we're going to, how we're going to roll this thing out and go forward. So, Chief Dorsell. This was a community collaborative effort too. So we've got you know healthcare partners, uh, community health, Northwest Florida, EMS, and other community partners. So Department of Health, uh, DCF. So it just not one organization. This is was a huge collaborative effort. I appreciate all these people here that helped out. Fantastic. Chief Torcell, uh, before you get started, would you mind introducing the panel here for those of us who are maybe, maybe not familiar with them? Yes, sir, Thank gladly. Uh, this, this is our team. Uh, this team has been together now, obviously, through our normal community involvement that we have with our services. However, uh, this team has been working for the past several months, as uh, Director Gilmore was talking about on this effort. Uh, I got to tell you, this is probably the best team effort I've ever been a part of. It has been seamless. Uh, we have just meshed together so well. Our communications is fantastic. Uh, and I believe this group is, is what we needed to make this, make this a go. So our team first uh, is, let me, let me give you the entities and then I'll-, I'll uh, Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, I will introduce each person from that entity. So first, the, the FQHC, Community Health Northwest Florida. We have Chandra Smiley. Uh, we have, uh, through the uh, local Florida Department of Health office, Ms. Marie Mott. We have our partners from all three hospitals. We have uh, HCA West Florida Hospital. They've changed their name. I got it right for the first time. Uh, their staff is with us today. We've got um, Dr. Mark Stavros, and we've got Tiffany Faulkner with us. Uh, they have been uh, instrumental in especially Dr. Stavros. Dr. Stavros uh, is not only a board certified emergency physician, but he's also board certified in addiction medicine. So I, as a paramedic, have just been picking his brain on a lot of stuff that is certainly not something that we normally do in our field to kind of have an understanding and kind of get my head wrapped around this, this process. Uh, we also have with us from uh, Sacred Heart Ascension, we have Chris, Christy Jandora and Drew Stringfellow. And a new one, Wes. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is our new EMS coordinator. Wes, I'm sorry. What is Wes Morris. Wes Morris. Wes he, Morris. He, Welcome aboard. I was just introduced to him by email the other day. He is our new EMS coordinator for the hospital that will be the liaison to us. So okay. cool. we actually just met in the hallway before I walked in for the first time. Uh, and then also we have with us uh, from Baptist Hospital. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, okay. Um, we have represented today Mike Rao and Heather Olmsted, and they are the directors of the ER that uh, coordinate with EMS on everything as well. I was just asking if we had, I thought we had some other visitors coming today, but we do not. So this is our team, um, and this team is just a solid team. Uh, the efforts that have been put forth, the, the ideas that have come from this group uh, have just been fantastic uh, because we recognize uh, what is going on. Um, and I wanted to do a little backstory before I jump into the, to the core program because you know, we're all data driven. We, we all want to know some things that are going on. You, you all are aware of what's happening in our community. Um, when I first got here, of course, as the EMS chief, you know, there's a lot of things that I had uh, that I needed to address as far as EMS goes and emergency medical services, et cetera. But aside from that, you know, I'm still responsible for 326,000 people, north to south, east to west. And with that, uh, one of the biggest things that I identified immediately was the copious amounts of overdoses that we are running. Uh, next month will be 26 years in public safety for me. And I'll, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I have never seen a situation in my experience as bad as I have in this community. Our overdose situation is horrendous. Uh, it, it's, it's almost a norm for people to go into a convenience store and someone's laying either unconscious, unresponsive, or dead in the parking lot from an overdose. And I couldn't wrap my head around, how, how is this normal? How, how is this may be acceptable, I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it just isn't. Uh, so with that, uh, immediately, you know, I, I started some conversations with Dr. Stavros, I started looking at our data, I started just tracking what, what are we doing here and, and, and what's happening uh, in our community. Um, 
Let me take you to this first slide. What I want to do is I want to give you some data that is just provisional for the state of Florida, and then I want to give you some data on what we have here local in our community. Um, again, provisional data, sometimes things change when they get information in from medical examiners on overdose-related data and as well as deaths as, uh, and things of that nature. But I mean, look at these numbers. Um, 122,000 EMS overdose responses. That, that is just an astounding number. Uh, and 35% of those are from opioids. Uh, st start to look at the Narcan administrations for uh, suspected opioid overdose. And, and we've had these discussions before. There's a lot of members of our community, a lot of our community partners that have the ability uh, to hand out Narcan, to do Narcan training. Our law enforcement partners are carrying Narcan. And we reached a point in EMS where we almost couldn't get Narcan. It was being used so much. Our suppliers had put us on a, uh, basically on a, uh, an allotment for 90 days and said, you can't have any more than this for 90 days. And we said, we'll use that in 30 days. What are we going to do for the other 60? Uh, and, and I don't mean that jokingly. I mean that serious to say, that's a huge problem if I need that much Narcan in this community. Yeah, absolutely. I, I never would have thought that would have been the drug that I'm seeking most, or the medication, excuse me, that we're seeking most in EMS over things like epinephrine and things that are what we would normally use for life-saving efforts. So two quick, uh, do you mind two quick questions on yes, the slide? Yes, sir. 67 uh, 63 were fatal overdoses uh, compared to 122,519 emergency medical responses to overdoses. So is that ratio about what we see here? A lot of people have asked me, they said, Jeff, you know, you're talking about 13, 1400 EMS overdose calls. How many died? And, and I just don't have that because the medical examiner is a lag. So does that ratio hold up locally as well? So it does, and it's actually more increased here. Uh, however, there are some things that can skew the numbers, and we want to make sure that's clear so that people understand. If I tell you, and, and I'll get to the slide here next, but yes, if sir. I tell you we've had X amount of overdoses, that doesn't mean every one of those single overdoses was a separate person. We do see repeat patients oh, yeah. that overdose, go to the hospital, wash, rinse, repeat. We see this over and over again. So, yeah, that number's high, but, again, if we address the core group of those people that are that are overdosing and get them the services that this program is going to provide, we should see a huge declination in that number. Now, unfortunately, that's why we have our law enforcement partners, because this group is not able to be the ones to get the drugs off the street. That's going to be in our law enforcement uh, officers' uh, responsibility. We've worked with them. We've talked with them about, you know, data that we have, information that's going on, what are they seeing, trending. But what's, what's kind of shameful is that we as an EMS service specifically, I can tell you based on data that I see on a daily basis where the drugs are and where they came in on that specific day before the, the law enforcement partners even know about it. Yep. Because we will have 6, 8, 10, 12 people overdose in a 6 to 8 block ratio that all live in the same neighborhood. And you went, well, there's where they distributed it. We just ran, you know, 8 to 10 overdoses in 12 hours in that area. That's where they put the new product. They're testing it. They're sending it out to see what the efficacy of it is and if it's something they're going to sell to these people or if they're going to go to something else. And that's unfortunate, but it's almost like they're using these people as uh, test subjects for their drugs. When you talk about running short of Narcan and a 90-day supply versus a 30-day supply, have you ever been, to, has it ever come to a point, because that's the first time hearing about it, I thought we could get it. I know places that have it. If you need more, I know where to get yes, it. Yes, sir. Um, but uh, have we ever had a situation where we've run out and you needed it? I'd like to know that if that's true, because I didn't we, know we had a shortage. We have not. We've, we've come to a point where we got low for what would be our normal stock levels. How many do you go through in a month, typical? Over 300, for sure, especially in our busier months. Uh, wow. you got to remember, each we, we have three main uh, companies that we get Narcan from. Mm -hmm. Each one at one point was giving us an allotment of 100 for, per 90 days. Uh, now, granted, we have it, it waxes and wanes. The summer months tend to be busier. The, the winter months, you know, holidays tend to be a little slower mm. uh, as far as call volumes and things. But uh, we also have the point of contact now for the HEROES grant where we can make some adjustments because sometimes what they will do is you, you order the specific dose and administration type that you want to give, and then they send you something else because that's all they have. Is it the same kind of Narcan that's distributed? Is it the nasal spray, or is yeah, it different? Yeah, we, so in EMS, obviously, because we have paramedics, we also can give IV. Okay. But it's the same stuff. You just have to put different devices on it, depending on if you're going to give it IV or nasally. Most of the community partners that all have it give it nasally because it's very easy to train them in. There's no IV necessary. There's no needle involved. It's just a simple, you know, uh, mist that goes up the nose. It's an atomizer device is what it's called. So, uh, but, yeah, same exact Narcan, various dosages. We get, um, and, and the unfortunate thing is, is if they have a large amount of Narcan with them that are in larger doses and we only need a portion of it, once you give it to a patient, you can't reuse it, so you have to waste it, you have to throw it out. Mm. So there, there are those complications as well. So 
I, I put these numbers up there preliminarily just for you to, uh, and this came from our, through our health department, through Marie, for you just to kind of look at on a statewide level. But what I really want to focus on is this next slide. You've seen our dashboard. You've seen the information we put up last year. This is what's most concerning to me. So last year, as you can see, we ran 1,095 overdose calls, and there were 1,391 Narcan administrations. Now, the reason, obviously, those two numbers aren't exact is because there are patients that required more than a single dose of Narcan to pull them out of their opioid state. With that, that is a 365 January 1 to December 31 calendar year. If you look at this year, here we are, September 8th, just in the first six months of this year, we surpassed the entire last year number for overdoses in the entire year in the first six months of this year. The 1,400 um, uh, and 23 that you see there was as of a couple of days ago. That dashboard updates every three to four days because of how it compiles the data. Some, some do every day, some are every couple of days. So we're well over 423 now. Uh, and I am, I am beside myself to say that in 20, almost 26 years next month with what I've seen in this community, you know, you think you've almost seen it all. You're not going to impress me with anything. You're not going to surprise me with anything uh, until I learned yesterday that our crews recently re revived an infant with Narcan. That is probably the most disappointing thing I think I've ever heard. Um, that means that drugs are able to be gotten in the hands of our children. Uh, first one that I know of in this particular type of instance, um, in my career, I've never administered Narcan to anybody under the age of 14. Uh, just, I've, I've, I've never had that present. So the fact that this happened here in our community is just astounding to me. I, I, I don't know, that, that just compounds the problem even more. As horrible as that is, that, that's terrible. But I'm also here, and, and tell me if this is true, that they're, they're putting this stuff in all kinds of different things. Like a kid might think he's taking ecstasy, but it's loaded with fentanyl, and then they die. Have you seen that locally? And I also heard they're putting it in marijuana weed. Um, have you seen that locally? We, we have. Uh, we, we know that based on the reactions that we're seeing from these various medications we're being told they take, ultimately, uh, the hospital staff, once the physicians evaluate them and do lab work, or unfortunately when they go to the medical examiner's office and an autopsy is done, that was when they will officially know from the blood work what was in there. We don't have a way to test that in the field, of course. Sure. Um, there are people that are quite honest with us and that we know, I, I hate to say that are regulars, but we, we know them from repeat transports. We know that they use drugs. We know what their drug of choice is. They tell us this. Mm. Uh, but again, that doesn't keep us in the loop of knowing what potentially may be in the drug they think they bought. Uh, however, fentanyl seems to be the number one thing we're hearing that's in. Uh, I, I sat in a District 1 meeting several months ago when someone in the, in the, the audience asked, you know, what, what are you guys seeing that's in these drugs that's causing this? Uh, and, and Dr. Stavros jokingly but very true said, well, three things, fentanyl, uh, fentanyl, and fentanyl. He couldn't be more right. We're, we're seeing this in all these medications, and it's unfortunate because the, the adverse effects that they expect they're going to get from these drugs are not what they're really getting when the potency of what's in their drug they didn't know it was laced with actually kills them. So it's, 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 a, it's a compounded problem. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, 1,143 administrations of Narcan just this year. Uh, if we keep on the pace we're going, we expect we're going to hit about 1,800, uh, give or take. Uh, we, we are entering into some slower months. But again, I mean, those numbers, they, they, they just... They speak volumes for what's happening here in our community. I've spoken to my counterpart in the school board and asked if there's Narcan available at the high school and middle schools. Do you know if that's the case? I haven't heard back from him. So I know they have health techs in some schools and nurses from my previous time yeah, on the board. To my knowledge, as far as like in their health clinics go, I do not believe they have Narcan available to them, to my knowledge. I know law enforcement officer partners carry Narcan and we yes. have Narcan. Um, however, there, there is kind of a, a battle out there. We've, we've met with our physician staff about the give back program. If you have areas that you know are going to be high instances of drug overdose, Narcan is, is, is pretty much harmless. It, it yes. works against opioids. So if you give it and they didn't take an opioid, it's not going to do anything. So why not give it out there where it could potentially save somebody's life sure. prior to us being able to get there or, or get you know, long-term medical care at a hospital? And, and that battle goes back and forth. You, know, you have to ask the higher level physician staff. Some will say, no, that's a terrible idea. Some will say, Psh, give it out like it's water. That's right. If you can, do it. Save people. Um, you know, and, Lumen, and I, are you, did you want to ask him a question? No, I, no, I just want a clarification. You said how was an infant that had Narcan? You um, it's an infant under the age of one. Uh, just for the instances of not saying anything here that perhaps may 
identify that particular circumstance. I would just rather say it's just an infant under the age of one. I'll leave it at that. Did he find the stash? I mean, can you just tell us that? I mean, I, obviously that's what happened. How else could it have been transferred to it? Yeah. So that, 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 that's the question is, is, is the environment the child was in potentially is, is where the child got it from? Um, based on, but, I mean, he could, could you've gotten Narcan from breast milk if he was being breastfed? Good question. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Could he have been, if, if the infant was being breastfed by the parent, could have gotten Narcan? They can't. The opioids. Oh, you mean the, the opioids? Yeah. No, no, not not not, not. with, not to, to be in the state that the infant was found. That's wow. not, yeah, that's not, uh, that's something different. So, right. but, but, well, but based on line. everything that presented, yes, we believe somehow you know it's an infant crawling around on the floor. We use our hands. Infants use their mouth to test everything. Probably found it, picked it up, put it in their mouth, and unfortunately, that was the result we saw. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, so again, this is the trend. So what we wanted to do, what we've, what we've come up with, and obviously our timing could not have been better, uh, myself, the sheriff, the state attorney, uh, Dr. Smith with the school board, and uh, Dr. Williams with Lakeview did a presentation to the Brownsville Community Center several months ago. Uh, briefly after that, Dr. Stavros and I had a meeting uh, discussing what we could potentially do here in our community to combat this effort. And the very next day, I got a phone call from the state saying, hey, we've got this new program hence the core program. Uh, timing, somebody was listening. Some, you know, I, I, think, I think there was some phone calls as well on some urgency for, uh, from our physician staff, Dr. Stavros specifically, that kind of had some discussions that got the involvement rolling. Uh, but unfortunately, because of our numbers, we have been identified as number one. Uh, and I wanna be clear on something because even I didn't see all this data until recently. 2019 and 2020, not only did we lead the state in opioid overdose and opioid death, but we specifically lead in uh, morphine overdose, fentanyl overdose, heroin overdose, and nothing to do with opioids, cocaine overdose. Scambia County leads the state in those four things. And while for those years there was a slight declination statewide in total overdoses per county, Scambia saw a double of our overdose rate. Why is that? Why is our community afflicted with this? Is it poverty or is it something different in your opinion you've got the brain trust here another question i want to ask i'm glad the media is here but this this is an emergency this is this is big but every night on national news all i hear about is monkeypox. have we even had one case here it's non-fatal citizens of escambia county are overdosing and dying and the national yes. media doesn't talk about it you this know, should be the story of our time are we on track for more deaths this year than last year because last year it was over a hundred thousand deaths in this country Oh, I can, I can only surmise countrywide, yes. Absolutely. How come the national media doesn't talk about this? You, you know, it's funny, and, and, and again, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a realist. I like to be honest. You, you know that of me. Yeah. Uh, it was brought to my attention that a local news media story over a cheerleading competition got more news media than the story about our core program when it first came out. And when that was brought to my attention, I went, there's part of the problem. We're focusing on the wrong stuff. Absolutely. This is a tremendous problem for our community. Uh, I, myself, uh, probably been more of the mouthpiece about it than, than others, but I've done it, I think, in a professional way to get the word out there, to get people to understand this is not going away. And if we continue to do things the way we've always done it, we're never gonna fix the problem. Um, we have a lot of great people in this community. We have a lot of great organizations that wanna take part, but I don't think everything has been aligned correctly mm -hmm. to where we can take hold of an opportunity like this and try something different. I mean, we, we've all heard the saying, do the same thing over and over again the same way and expect a different result. That's the definition of insanity. Sure it is. That's what I see. And in our continuum of care, it's there. But if it's so great, why are we failing so miserably? Is it because this, is, this synthetic stuff is so addictive that these guys can't, even when they get out of jail, the first thing they do is go shoot up. I mean, many of them, they're so addicted. They've gone through treatment. I know the story of a 27-year-old young man Went through treatment multiple times. People were trying to help him. He had a job. The minute he got out of rehab the third time, he went down to a dangerous part of town, and it was a drug deal gone bad. You probably heard about it. He got shot to pieces in yeah, a truck and burned to death. Is it because it's so addictive? Is that why? And if, if it is, how do we overcome that? I mean, we've got an addiction specialist here. How do you overcome it when we it's do. that? And, and Dr. Stavros, if I, if I'd like to have him speak on behalf of that. Please. Because it, when you asked about the answers, um, it, I think it's a multitude of things. I think, uh, I think the location where we're at, you have easy access through the I-10 corridor for things to be delivered to this. We, we are kind of a vacation destination. I mean, look, look at our beautiful beaches, our community. A lot of people want to come here. 
you have a state just across the border where, you know, it, it, again, it's easy access to get out of the state of Florida. We have a state just to the north of us where it's easy access. And I can't even answer for what law enforcement is seeing on their behalf as to what they think some of the reasonings are of why it's so heavily uh, concentrated here in this We've area. We've had a drug problem in this community forever. Since yes, I sir. went to high school here, when I was on the school board, we'd kick out, when I first started in 06, we were kicking out 20 kids on every monthly agenda for, I mean, we've always had a drug problem. This, it, when it starts killing people, I think that's, I think that's really where it, it got some people's attention. But sadly, again, you know, we're just, we're not getting enough, we're not getting enough coverage of this. Maybe sure. we can change that. But Dr. Jeff, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, depends on your media sources. I mean, it, it is a large epidemic, but you can correlate it to the counties with poverty, whether it's gas and whether it's a scam. So when you look at this drug, I don't necessarily problem. know that that's I mean, it though, Lumen. There's a lot of poor rural counties in the middle of the state, poorer than we are, and I don't see them with this problem. Well, I'll admit, why are we having the problem here in Escambia County? Anyway, Dr. Stabber. If you had that answer, you'd be a billionaire. Well, we got to figure it out because I don't want anyone. I hate hearing about people dying. How do you how do you get someone off these things that are so addictive? So let me go back to the original question that you had yeah. about the addiction issue. You know, why are these people? Is it because it's the drug that's so much more addictive? It's just addiction. That's the bottom line. The brain has changed. We have realized, and I gave a long lecture about this, but I'll keep it very short. Addiction is a brain disease. We think of it like a behavioral disorder. We've thought about it as a behavioral disorder. Can you for speak years. more into the mic? What's, yeah, sure. Thank you. We've thought about addiction as a behavioral disorder for decades, but it's not just a behavioral disorder. There's choice involved, but we started realizing that it also is a medical condition too, just like diabetes, right? So if you're a diabetic and I say, hey, listen, you need to, you might need to be on medication. Sure, you might need to be on medication, you might need to treat it medically, but the first thing I'm gonna tell you to do is lose weight, exercise, eat correctly. There's a behavior that also has to change too. Hypertension is the same way, asthma is the same way. As we started realizing this is a disease of the brain, the brain's changed. And at some point, we need to start addressing it, not only from a behavioral standpoint, but also a medical standpoint. And so, we actually have treatment to, to help with this. So in your experience, someone who's addicted to this fentanyl, heroin, how many of them can actually kick it? You kick the sheets and, and get out from under it and, and, and long just, term. Yeah, if you just took all patients and you said, listen, we're just going to use behavioral therapy. We're not going to use any medications. We're going to give them the counseling they need. We can put them through detox. Most detox is not a year long, right? It's a very finite amount of time. It might be 14 days, 30 days. Maybe you have really good insurance and get 60 days. But the bottom line, at one year, the relapse rate is over 80%. That's pretty bad. I thought I would, frankly, I would have thought it would have been higher, but I'm, I mean, it's, how did the 20% do it? How do they do it? Well, I mean, again, they probably have better support systems for one thing. They, they are getting into a situation where they're having a lot more support, whether they have a job, that type of security, maybe their family, their friends are helping them out in that regard. So how do people just quit smoking too? I mean, it's hard. Believe me, yeah, so. Tell me about it. It took me five times. Doug, you're recognized. Thanks. Um, Mr. Chairman, certainly the, the, the core uh, funding has a, a very specific purpose, and it's a, and, you know, critically uh, critical that we address the people that have already been victimized. But you know, to go to your, your issue about why the recidivism rate, <laughs> when you come out of alcohol rehab, if you go straight back into hanging out at bars but saying, hey, I'm not going to drink, um, you're going back into an environment that yeah. promoted that behavior. If our neighborhoods, and as long as our neighborhoods are flush with the drugs, these people don't stand a chance of staying on the wagon by going back into their neighborhoods where they became an addict to begin with. You, I mean, if you, if you, you wouldn't let your alcoholic brother uh, start hanging out at bars again. If you saw him doing that, right, you would re-engage. You try. With regard to opioids, and because it's so systemic in our neighborhoods, um, there is, there, I mean, we, I mean, we're gonna spend a lot more money on more Narcan, and we're gonna continue to do that, but until we, really take a look at our budget and, and at our sheriff's office and say, get it out of our neighborhoods. We're not fixing anything. We're actually creating the next overdose victim because we're getting him healthy and back on the street again where he's going to go back into that environment um, and the stat cards are stacked heavily against him. So you, know, uh, uh, you mentioned actually, as the previous speaker mentioned, that you see these things, you see the hot spot, right, <laughs> by where the ambulance goes. Um, that data set should be able to enable us to make it very clear that if you're engaged in this, and you, you should be considered a, a public enemy if you're engaged in this business, and we should have we should empower our sheriff's office uh, through through funding and through ordinances 
to, to effectively go after them and, pro and get them out of the neighborhoods. Give them the Narcan, give them the 30, 60, 90 days of, of care, get them cleaned up. They walk out of there wanting to be clean and we put them right back in the cesspool that created the problem. Until we fix the cesspool, we can, we can you know, dump tens of millions in Narcan and not solve it. Thanks, uh, Lumen, and then Robert. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we could pump a billion dollars into law enforcement, and we still don't have drugs. Uh, this is a stabilization program after the fact, and this is great. But until we put money into prevention, I mean, there is a demographics of people who become addicted to drugs. Yep. And so, I mean, if we're not going to, you know, take money and put it into some type of prevention program, then I mean, we'll, we'll be doing this forever. I mean, why why do you eat healthy? Why do you start exercising so you don't have a heart attack? I mean, so. I'm all for this and I, whatever law enforcement, you can't lock them all up. I mean, the point is that we should be putting some of our energies and resources into prevention programs. We absolutely can lock up the drug dealers. We absolutely can. I'm not talking about locking up the people who have become victims of it, but we absolutely know where, I mean, in my district, I mean, you know where the drug houses are. And when somebody sends code enforcement over there and that kind of thing. We get, well, Doug, we get serious I, about Doug, locking those people well, up. Yeah, well, Doug, then I, we have a chance of our people not continuing to fall I victim agree. to their to their drugs. But the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. We but do, we ain't doing well, that. That's, well, that's, that's, we ain't that's, law, that's law enforcement. Well, but law we're, enforcement. We're, not, we're not trying. We're not trying. We're not putting money into prevention programs. That's what we're not doing. We're, we're, we're not putting enough money into our human services. Now, that's a fact. Uh, I'd certainly I mean, agree, so, yeah. I'd certainly agree with the prevention programs. Uh, but if you think that we can, I mean, there's absolutely no way that we can continue to allow illegal activity to take place rampantly in our neighborhoods. I can go down to Barrancas right now and pick up some drugs oh, if I, I wanted to. You. Oh. you know that. Yeah. And as long as we let those people walk around and let them do their, apply their trade in our county, then yeah, we're going to have to continue to pick up the pieces and the mess that they create for us. Yeah, and I, and I don't have the data to support you know, of what I'm saying, Doug, but I, I'm sure that we have somebody else that's smarter. We create these situations. If you really want to know what we're going to do about drugs, we put our kids on Ritalin. We put them on drugs to, to do behavior modification. Uh, they exit out of 12th grade with a dependency on something to stabilize their life because, I mean, it's so horrible. And then we throw them out, and then they end up doing drugs. And so, I mean, the problem is, is more... A complex, you know, than just locking people up. It's more complex than getting some somebody some Narcan. I mean, we have a societal problem in that we're never going to cure it all. It's like we're not going to cure poverty, we're not going to cure homeless, but we can put a dent in it by starting at some point and putting money into some prevention programs. Yeah, no, no doubt it's a complex problem, and no doubt it's a complex problem that involves a very heavy uh, uh, law enforcement aspect on the, on the uh, on those who are causing the problem. Robert. Thank you, uh, Chief. Uh, I know on that allocation of um, allotment of uh, Narcan, I think you were able to reach out and get a get a supervisor or somebody to actually give us more than what they had planned on sending, right? I mean, that was. Yes, sir. That's correct. So the the Heroes Grant that we applied for, that we get the Narcan through, um, we have the point of contact with them just simply because we we are a higher user of it. So they have the ability to realize that you know whatever milligram dosage we order it in the type of distribution, whether it's needle or through the nasal device that I was telling Commissioner Bergash about, uh, we have the ability to contact them and, and somewhat curtail and say, hey, listen, we, this is how much we have. You're saying our next delivery isn't until this date, but uh, so, here's what we're going to need. So and they're working with us on it. Absolutely. To make sure yeah, that, yeah. So, they, which is, they understand there's areas is that are, that are hot spots that use more. Um, and I mean, uh, uh, in, in uh, being with you guys over Blue Angel Weekend and stuff like that, you know, you hear stories that I mean, sometimes you're administ administering four or five, six doses to, to someone for, uh, for a single episode. So, I mean, that's depleting the supply as well. Um, so in the, um, I, I guess as part of this uh, overall uh, core program, uh, it looks like the, the state has announced yesterday that, uh, that the health department will start having um, uh, kits with two nasal sprays that can be administered without the help of a health care provider. Uh, what concerns me a little bit about this is that uh, in the initial phase, 16 counties are receiving 1,500 kits each, and they're all somewhat, they're all smaller counties. Uh, and, you know, we it did talk about Gadsden had an issue with um, uh, nine in a day, nine, 19 overdoses over a four day span, uh, where there was a uh, caused nine deaths. Um, 
in, in, uh, in July. Uh, but my question is, what's the shelf life on these? Because, um, you know, it seems like 1,500 kits going to these small counties. Um, I, I would, I'd, I mean, I can start reaching out to them or maybe have our health department start reaching out to them that if, if they start to move towards their expiration date, S send them our way uh, just to make sure that it's it's used. I, I hate to say it that way, but um, you know, it, I mean, it seems like 1,500 kits. Again, if there's an expiration date, I don't know how what the shelf life is on it, but um, I, I think we should probably looks like our, the closest one to us would be Gulf County. Um, you know, just see what what they're going through. Uh, but that's uh, ultimately it'll it'll be in our health department as as well. But. So most of what we, most of the medications we carry traditionally when we're not under any type of uh, situation like we are with the Narcan, the average medication we order, say epinephrine, uh, most of our boxes are good for at least two years uh, when we get them. However, because of the state of how many people are ordering Narcan, we may get a box of Narcan in, but the date on them for expiration is only good for six months. Mm -hmm. The next order we get in may be good for a year and a half. The next order we may get in, be, and, and we've already put a system in place here locally because with EMS not being the only one that utilizes Narcan, like I said, our law enforcement officer uh, partners have them as well as corrections. When they start reaching their expiration dates uh, at those facilities, we know we are going to use an abundant amount more than they are, so we trade them out. We say, give us what you have that's about to expire. We'll give you some with new dates. We'll order the new, and we've been rotating that out with Chief Pal, et cetera, to try to facilitate that so we don't have a large portion of Narcan that just suddenly doesn't get used and gets, you know, gets wasted. Uh, and we've been very, very efficient with that for about the last six to eight months. That That's was one of the first things we did when I met with Chief Powell when I, when I started here. Perfect. Good to hear. Thank you. Commissioner Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to uh, agree with my colleague, with Commissioner May, talking about prevention. I mean, that's, you know, and, and certainly our partners here, you know, are really focused as, as EMS is going to be focused on, you know, taking care of the, uh, in a very reactionary state of, of, you know, dealing with the situation as to what's happening. You know, this happened today. We had, we, you know, we had to, uh, we had to deploy emergency vehicles uh, to handle, you know, to, to help the citizen and then get the citizen to, uh, to one of our facilities to be stabilized. So, I mean, on this side of it, it's a very, you know, reactionary. I mean, we, you know, we have the ER, you know, the people that are running the ERs and those things, and, and that's certainly their responsibility, and, and David's responsibility is to run, uh, is to get people, um, you know, from a dangerous situation to somewhere they can get care. Um, but. You know, and that's and, and that's the focus of the of the panel that's with us today, but the prevention and trying to, you know, try to have fewer of those instances of need, you know, would seem to be what's going to have a long, you know, what's going to have a long term effect is have fewer reactionary needs that occur, um, you, fewer instances that are going to require this type of care. I mean, that's where. I mean, that's where it would seem like a community can make a long, you know, a, a large impact in the long term. And, um, you know, I, I, I would think as part of, you know, as part of the discussion, and again, it's not, it's not David's responsibility, but, um, you know, as the, as the funders, as the funders of these departments and, and, you know, even, even some of our constitutional partners, um, the mental health aspect of it is, I mean, it can't be dismissed. You know, I know there's there there, there are certainly long-term physical you know physical um, you know outcomes from you know from this type of use, and even if someone doesn't you know doesn't uh, you know is not deceased from their behavior, there are long-term physical you know physical outcomes from this behavior. But I don't know you know analytically how the number could be arrived at, but it has to be a very large portion. Of mental illness that goes into that goes into the makeup that ends up with this behavior occurring, and you know, I, I, again, we you know we can't we can't put an exact number on the folks that are in the county jail that are uh, that have mental you know that have uh, some type of mental health issue, but it is the majority. There's no one that disputes it's not the majority that that are in the county jail out of those 15 or 16, 1700 people, how many ever we have, and. It would also seem to reason that the majority of, uh, you know, the majority of instances that end up, you know, uh, perhaps not, you know, perhaps not like a, you know, one-time event where, um, you know, a, a person, you know, has some type of binge behavior and and overdoses. I mean, we see news stories about, you know, this, you know, and there were a lot of these with uh, college, you know, college having kids back, you know, a few weeks ago, and you know, there were different headlines of. 
you know, at this university there was, you know, there were two deceased from, you know, overdosing from this or that. I mean, some of that binge behavior, you know, maybe, maybe you don't see a lot of mental illness or mental health issues contributing to that type, but for the chronic, you know, for, for what ends up being chronic behavior and repetitive behavior, as a layperson, it would seem like you've got that you've got a large portion of the people that end up being whether you know Dave, uh, Eric referred to him or, or David, as you know we recognize these people we know what their we know what their addiction you know what their drug of choice is or we know what their you know we know what uh, we when we get a call from uh, you know from John Doe, we have a pretty good idea of what has probably gone on before we get there. Okay, it does stand to reason that a lot of those people have ended up in those situations because of different types of mental illness. And I, I, again, I don't, I don't know how those things, I don't know how those things are solved. I'm not qualified to assess that, but as we have opportunities to put money into prevention and especially into mental health, it seems like, you know, that's may not have uh, bear fruit within a year or two, but over a generation or, you know, even maybe over a five or 10 year period, that type of resources getting allocated to prevention and mental health probably would have, you know, would have some type of outcome. In, you know, and uh, you know, David, you know, mentioned our, you know, mentioned our standing in the state, or ranking in the state, you know, uh, for population, which is you know not good, and maybe that's indicative of uh, uh, too much reactionary behavior and not enough preventative and mental health uh, help on the front end. Yeah, I agree, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Berry, I certainly agree with you that there has to be more energy put toward our mental health. And, and, and prevention. I mean, you don't wake up one day an addict. I mean, it's a gradual process. And I, I think that, you know, there are some opportunities. I mean, even through the uh, Children Trust, uh, that if we had programs that would address that. And so certainly, you know, we're just elected commissioners, but I mean, a panel like this, Mr. Chairman, uh, the expertise that we have mm -hmm. uh, would be great. I mean, if they continued to not only address this stabilization model, but if there were recommendations and situations on, on, on prevention and other things that we can do, I think it would be beneficial because, I mean, you know, one of the questions I would have is, you know, this is a three-year grant, right, Chief? Or how, how long is this? So each, each cycle block of funding goes for one year. The expectation on this initial process is for three years, and uh, the state, uh, their plan is to add at least five additional counties of the 67 counties every couple of years thereafter until it spreads out. What they're doing is using us for our metrics and our data to see how how successful we are. And what will we do if the state stopped funding it? I mean, how will we fund it? How, what would be that recommendation? Yeah, so we've, uh, as far as uh, this, so let me, let me take a step back. So as far as this program goes, and I, I want to be able to tell you how the model is set up and then how it's going to fit our community. Yes, sir. So, uh, yes, sir, thank you. Um, I'm sure <laughs> I'll need you again, trust me. Um, so uh, as far as this goes is, um, tell me your original question again, Commissioner May. <laughs> I want to make sure I answer it. Uh, I, my question was simply this, uh, how will we fund this, what would be the, the funding source uh, if the state withdraws or after three years it's no longer okay, in place? Perfect. I mean, because the community has become dependent right. on this Narcan, I mean, and so we, we just can't stop it at that point. No, you're right. If there's a So as far as this need. program goes and funding is aware, th this, this was easy for us because number one on the front end, hospitals have always had the availability to some degree to do the induction process that they're doing now, which is initiating the, hey, do you want to get out of this behavior? Do you want to, do you want to be drug free? Do you want to go through this medication assisted therapy? They've had the availability to do that. There's not a tremendous cost associated with that. The patient's already in their facility. Number two, the funding they're getting on the front end that we have asked for in our budget is for them to one, have funding to train their staff, which they can do internally. And two, is we, we as a group decided the best way to serve these patients was not have them in the hustle and bustle of the regular general part of an ER, but to put them in a separate place where they can have that induction process. It's quiet, it's more uh, on a personal level, and you feel like somebody is there with you rather than just coming in, checking on you, hey, you gotta hurry, sure. do vitals, and we're out to the next patient. So the money they're getting on the front end for that, once those rooms are, are constructed and built in each hospital, they're done. There is no going back for continued funding on that. So that part is done for the hospitals. So we'll be able to continue the program, the hospitals. We will, as far as for the FQHC and for EMS, Again, on the front end, our cost is uh, some fuel, which we've already accounted for in our budget. The vehicle that we're being purchased up front, which we've already accounted for for future, if, if 
You know, they said 10 years from now, we're never gonna buy you another vehicle. Well, that's okay, we've already planned for that. And lastly is the staff. Uh, I've already worked with the public safety director who has been speaking with our county administrator to discuss that we need additional FTEs already in EMS just for the service we provide. Even when my FTE roster, my position control roster is completely full, that doesn't mean we're, we're adequately staffed. It just means the piece of paper that I have that says here's how many employees I have are enough. So we could do this program with or without the state funding is what you're that saying. That is correct because all we're gonna so do we is would, continue we, to utilize this initial this. process to move forward. Excuse, excuse me, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, no worries, you, my apologies. We, we, we would have implemented this program whether or not we received this funding from the state. That is correct because we have curtailed this model to fit what we have available in our community rather than trying to copy some of the larger communities that you know, a Palm Beach County has a lot of money. Uh, Miami-Dade has a lot of money. We, we know where we fit in that, and we said, hey, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, and how do we use that to our benefit? And that's what we did on the front end, knowing um, that if a year goes by or two years go by and they go, listen, everything fell through, there's no more money, that's okay. We can still continue to do what we're doing. Right, yeah, that's just what, you know, I wanted to clarify that this treatment model is sustainable. Yes, sir, it is. It is very sustainable. How much has the state given us? So on the front end, uh, and I, if, if no, I, please, I'm sorry, yes, sir, we're I, jumping I ahead. It, it's, no, no worries. Yeah. Uh, so when they approached us, they initially said, hey, listen, from this initial ask, you have your team together with your hospitals, your FQHC, your EMS service. Uh, they're looking at about a million dollars on the front end, give or take, but you submit your budget. So we kind of went through this process where we were like, are we asking for too much? Are we not asking for enough? Those just Always ask for more. Always ask for more. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> Always Government ask for budgeting. more. So, you know, we didn't want to seem like we were being overzealous, but we also didn't want to say, all right, we cut it right at a million dollars. We said, listen, legitimately, with the services we have, the partners we have, this is how much money we need to make this a go. Uh, it came out to about $1.474 million. Um, the only thing on the initial ask, I believe, if I'm correct, Marie, that they told us we could not get, which we've already worked on the back end with another entity with the state through the managing entity was the funding for the pharmaceuticals themselves. Okay. So the medications that are going to be administered to these patients to get them off of the drugs they're on, if you or I or whatever company has a drug license and you go to one of these companies that sells medications like the ones we buy now, mm -hmm. a 30-day supply of this medication, depending on the dose and where you get it from, ranges anywhere between $320 and $540 a month. And they won't let us use their money to pay for that? So they will not. However, they're, by going through the managing entity through the state, which kind of is partnered with DCF, uh, through other channels where there's other pots of money, we mm -hmm. have already met with them to have a discussion on funding for pharmaceuticals. I've already forwarded them a letter, and they've already um, preliminarily approved funding the pharmaceuticals. So that's covered as well. I, I've heard Suboxone treatment's going to be offered, and I know that... Um but in reading, doing some research on this topic, which is of great interest to me, um, without tremendous support, counseling, casework, it becomes a, a problem that just gets switched because people become addicted to that and they abuse it. So what is our strategy if we're gonna buy that very expensive drug using taxpayer money to ensure that the people have the support? Is that part of what this group is doing and, and what does that look like? Because otherwise, it, many communities have found they've just tr traded problems. And no, it is, and, and I've heard that. You're just switching one addiction for another, which, which I say, challenge accepted. Yeah. Uh, so let me, let me explain the operational part, and then as far as the drug goes, let me have Dr. Stavros explain that part with, Please. with, with the medication side from a physician standpoint. So operationally, um, the, the part that I haven't got to yet is, if you look at the model that's in front of you, this is just the, the general stabilization model. You've got rescue response, we go out to the field, the typical pick them up, take them to the hospital, hospital treats them, and then they could go to, with a referral, if they're willing to go through the induction process, they go to a long-term treatment, right? That is the base model that you're seeing in front of you. And I'm kind of getting out of order with our slides, but I want to answer your questions Thank as you. they're coming. So um, our model's a little different. The one thing we recognized in our, in our, uh, our, our group and in our community is we are missing the wraparound, the, the, the case management, the individualized uh, attention. We're missing that. You can't expect someone to go to a hospital with a drug overdose, be treated, offer them services, give them a piece of paper and say, be at that address a week from now, that's your long-term appointment, and not expect in that week that they're not gonna go back to drugs and my team's gonna pick them up again, take them back to the hospital, wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah. So and how and we, when, you mi when you mix in the mental health that Commissioner Barry mentioned, because that's so true, and those people 30, 60 days, if they can even get in, there's, there's just no, there's no one who can take them. There, there's a real shortage of the, the so, qualified so, counselors that can help these people. That's correct, and we have, we, have a, we have a solution for that as well. So number one, as yeah. Commissioner Barry mentioned, yeah. addiction and mental health, they go hand in hand. Yeah. They're not separate. 
there is some form of, of mental health, uh, and I would let the professional speak to that, but there is always some form of a mental health issue involved with addiction. So we know that those services completely need to be provided simultaneously. That's gonna be something provided for the long-term care. The, the point to go back to the beginning is, after they go to a hospital, what our team is going to do as part of our model, and let me just fast forward so you can see it, but I'll explain it as we're there, because there's, there's several other things that you'll probably have questions about. And by the way, will you please forward that slide to my office? Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so if you look at Escambia's addiction stabilizations model, we have added a component there that we believe was probably one of the sole missing pieces to this process. So someone goes to the hospital, whether they're completely overdosed or they're just saying, hey, listen, I have an addiction problem, I need help. They get medical treatment, uh, physician staff uh, take them through the induction process. They say, yeah, listen, I want this medicine. I want to be better. I want to be able to change my life. Okay, well, previously they were just going to get a piece of paper, kick them out the door and send them to a long-term addiction uh, you know, treatment, and maybe you will see them and maybe you won't. So how do we intercept between the day they leave the hospital and the time of the first day of their appointment? That is where community paramedicine comes in, and that was the whole kind of premise of the health access, resiliency, and telehealth division with the state's point for this program was community paramedicine can go out, find these people where they are, meet with these people where they are on a regular basis, have that face-to-face -face interaction, the warm handoff that, listen, you see my face, may not be a pretty one, but I'm gonna be the one you're gonna be seeing and I'm gonna go through this journey with you. You are 10 times more likely to say, okay, I'll bite, I'll do this, I'll try it because- Like a this, sponsor, like a Right, because sponsor. this guy or this gal or whoever part of the team is coming to my house checking on me daily. Right. Vital signs, assessment. What other needs do you have? How's your food situation? Do you have other medicines you can't get? Do you have a telephone where if you need to contact us, you can get in touch with us? These are processes that should have been looked at forever because just because my service is an EMS service and may not provide those doesn't mean I may not know who you can get those from and contact those people and say, hey, over here at this house, I need this for these people and here's why. So it's a complete wraparound service from the minute they go to the hospital and the hospital gives them this service, inducts them into the process, gives them their first dose of medication, our community paramedicine staff, and we're working still on peer support because that is an essential part of this, someone who's been through addiction themselves, will be meeting with this patient before they ever even leave the hospital. So once they meet us, they know, hey, warm handoff, we're the face you're gonna see within 24 hours, we're gonna come out to your home, homeless encampment, wherever they're staying, we have the ability to do that. Uh, and, and there is a sense of trust factor, believe it or not, with you know, EMS and, and, and fire folks. I've seen it for 26 years. If, and, and I mean no offense to anybody when I say this, it's just a fact. If a law enforcement officer shows up in a community like that, everyone's on edge. Sure. When paramedics and firefighters show up, they tend to kind of a little more willing to talk to us because we're not the law. It's right. just a simple fact of human nature. Sure. And I mean no disrespect when I say that. No, we no, have I wonderful know. law enforcement agencies, but that's the way it is. We have an in with these people. So much that a lot of times when my staff pick them up, even if they're not overdosed, they'll converse with, the, hey, how's this, how's that? Because they've seen them so many times, they know who they are. There is a rapport there. So if my staff are following them from the day that they're discharged to the hospital, doing regular appointments at their home or wherever they're at, assessments, bringing them into this process, all up until the first day, that they go to their long-term addiction and do that nice warm handoff again, mm -hmm. where our FQHC staff are going to meet with our staff in the field before they ever go to that appointment the first day. You know who you're going to see before you ever go to see them. Will you, you be reporting the metrics on uh, attrition and things of that nature? Because that's gonna be something very interesting. And we important. are, so they're trying to keep, obviously everybody's circumstances different. Some people have more resources than others, but the general consensus that they're looking for in however we provide that data across the board is things like, like uh, Commissioner Underhill uh, mentioned, recidivism. Yeah. We're also, you know, we can look through our report writing software that we bought last year. I can put a patient's name in and see every time we've transported them back to the first date we ever transported them. Well, if I know that those are drug overdose patients and I start looking at those and after the institution of this program, I don't see that patient's name anymore or I saw it 10 times last year and I only see it one time this year, we're obviously having an effect on this person yes. because they're a part of our program. Now, again, numbers, Numbers are going to skew a little bit depending on is it someone who's, you know, overdosed 10 times this year versus the one overdose we took for that patient. But at the end of the day, being there from beginning to end with no missing component just to send them off to an appointment that they may or may not make, uh, we believe is going to be a tremendous part of what has been missing in these services that were previously available. They could always have gone to a hospital and got induction, and they could always have gone to long-term treatment. 
It's that middle piece where we go, what are they doing while they're waiting for their appointment? Who's watching them? Who's right. checking up on them? Who's giving them tough love? Because that's what they're going to need. They're going to need honesty. They're going to need a little tough love. And they're going to need someone to go, hey, I'm here for you. If they drop out or self-select out or want to go on a bender for two weeks, three weeks, will you bring them back? And if so, how many times will you wash, rinse, repeat, to use your terminology? Because, again, this, is, this will be a taxpayer-funded thing. We want to help people. We want to be compassionate. So this, but we don't want to be enablers. Yeah, so I, I want to be clear. This could be a tax funder, uh, taxpayer funded thing. One way or if, the other, it will be. If, if the state, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and I agree with you. At some point, there may be some items that we need to buy that are going to come from. But remember, too, EMS generates its own revenue. We're not paid for by the taxpayers. So we write off a lot of stuff too, though. We we do, and and part of part of what we're doing here is there is a uh, there's another program that we're instituting simultaneously with this called 911 Telehealth. Uh, we've had a brief discussion about that. I'll briefly touch it. 911 Telehealth means all of those non-essential calls to 911 where we show up for someone that's got knee pain they've had for 30 years, a toothache. Right. Uh, I need a prescription refill, but they called 911. We have the ability to connect them, and he's actually one of the physicians on telehealth to an iPad to meet with a physician face to face that says, what's going on? Does a quick assessment. Nope, you don't need that. You don't need to go to the hospital by ambulance. Let me call you in a script. We'll call you by tomorrow and get you back. And my ambulance goes back. Yeah, in I service. love that. No, I know Santa Rosa County is doing it. Santa Rosa yeah. County is doing it already. Yes, sir. So, so we do have several things in place to, you know, again, to talk about a lot of the things that were written off. We, we do have some things in place to, to try to, uh, to thwart that. At the round table of people. And, and by the way, thank you all very much for being here. I know you're all very busy and you got a lot going on on the plate, but this is important. I mean, uh, uh, very, very important. Um, at your roundtable meetings, to me, part of what you got to discuss when we're talking about tackling the problem it has to be has to be the law enforcement side of it and the supply side. And that's another thing you don't hear much about in the national media um, or even, frankly, in the local media. But where is this stuff coming from and how do we stem the supply? Again, it's not like this just happened overnight. We've always had a drug problem in Escambia County. I grew up here. Sure. It's always been here, always. Something's changed. We've got some, something has changed, and it's this highly addictive lab created fentanyl from China that's somehow getting here in mass quantities. So I think is when you meet and you guys talk about all the things you're going to do clinically, and that's great, part of it has to be how do we stop the supply? How do we get serious about that? Because we, if we ignore the reason, if we ignore problems at the border for political reasons and, and, and people's sensitivities, then we're not really going to solve the problem. We're just going to be putting Band-Aids on severed limbs. So are you, are you interfacing with law enforcement? Because that's a critical component. Mr. Chairman, can I, can, yeah. can I just respond? And, please, and, please and, do. And, and I've certainly heard from you and my other colleague about law enforcement. And you know, certainly we need safe neighborhoods and we need law enforcement. Fentanyl, an opioid, a pain pill, you know, it's a drug. So you know, it's just not street level people or somebody at a oh, wall no. in China. No, it's not. So why don't you arrest the doctors that are over prescribing it? You know, I in think our they hospitals. Have been. I mean, they have. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, so it's just, it's just, we we can't put this trajectory out there. Oh, it's just some street level people hanging out on barrancas in the hood selling drugs and fentanyl. Sure. There's more fentanyl being prescribed legally uh, in doctors' offices and in hospitals and right here in the United States. I don't know that it's not, fentanyl being pres prescribed. Well, opioids, which yeah. turn yeah. drugs. So, I mean, it's just not street. There's not street level people are not yeah. in this drug. The thing is, Lumen, I agree with you. I, I like the prevention. Can I go ahead? But I sat in meeting after meeting for 10 years on the school board. Red Ribbon Week, DARE, every program you could think of. And it, it never solved the problem. We have prevention programs. Maybe we need to make them more robust. I'm all for it. I'm for an all of the above approach. But you cannot ignore the supply side. That's where it's coming from. You know, there are people that no matter what you do, no matter how many rehab programs, like the young man, the 27-year-old with a young one-year-old daughter, couldn't kick it. Ended up in a bad part of town, got shot, and burned to death. It's sad, but what, something has changed though. We've always had the drug problem, but now suddenly people are f falling out and dying. And so how do we, how do we address the supply? And so how do we get people off this stuff once they're addicted? So we've had that interface with law enforcement. Uh, at the end of the day, we're medical professionals. So for us to give any data we can to law enforcement on how this program works and what it entails and what the expectation is it will do mm -hmm. to help them is certainly, I'm, I'm sure, in some way beneficial to them. But Are they the at the table with you guys right now? Does the not sheriff? for this core program. They're not because okay. this is 100 percent 
medically involved with patients who, who need to come off of the drug. Are you aware, is there a separate track with FDLE and the local agencies and the federal? I mean, where I, I, people are going to want to know. If, I, if I'm thinking of it, I, believe me, people are thinking it too because they call me and they stop me at Walmart and they ask me these questions. Sure. They want to know, okay, this is great. We want to help people, want to be compassionate, want to do all this, all of the above. Uh, but what are we doing to stop the supply that's coming over the border? What are we doing in Florida to stop that? That, that would be a great question for local law enforcement to answer for you to, as to where the drugs are coming from. Because that's some of that stuff you got to remember, too. They're not going to share with us because that's sensitive information that's not allowed to be shared outside of law enforcement. Well, uh, the other yeah. part to that, too, Mr. Chair, is respectfully, yes. I think with this program, if the supply is the issue and we can't control the supply, by fixing these patients, however many it may be, mm -hmm. we can control the demand. Well, I hope that we can. The, the, I mean, as a nation, we've never been able to. It's been that, a failure. That, you're you're there's absolutely there's right. Come on, man. It was a 40-year war on drugs with right. Ronald, Ra Ronald Reagan. And the yeah. solution we came up with, Ronald Reagan, and 40-year war right. on drugs was incarcerate. We agree. Yeah, it was a incarcerate people who Complete have a dependency. Yep. That doesn't work, locking people up sure. because they have a, an addiction. I mean, it's ridiculous. But that's another political conversation. Mm -hmm. so, so for us, this program... Uh, we, we've added components that, that just weren't there. The two big pieces we thought were the wraparound services I talked about, case management, following through with these people from beginning to end, not just, hey, go here and we'll see in a few days or a week or whatever. The other parts of that, as you mentioned, well, what about these staffs? The, the, the appointments are difficult to get for these people. Or they go somewhere and they wait for two, three hours in the lobby and say, I'm done, and they walk out. Part of this grant for our FQHC was specifically asking for additional staff, and those okay. additional staff members are going to be assigned to appointments for only these people. Okay, so that good. when you know your appointment is at 11 o'clock on Thursday, you go there for your 11 o'clock appointment on Thursday, you're not waiting behind a line of 10 other people because that's your appointment time for this particular program. Um, the other part to that is transportation services. Mm -hmm. We have, you would think as simplistic as transportation services are, that that wouldn't be as much of a problem getting these people to appointments. Evidently it is after I've, I've talked to all these people. Yeah, we have people that are like, I'm out. I can't get there. I have no way to get there. I live miles away, whatever. Do you give them an Uber card or something? How do you get so, them there? So we've talked about that. Yeah. We talked about the Uber and some yeah. of the other organizations locally that do transport. And at best, what I'm hearing is it's very unreliable. So what we've decided to do Wait, was... I, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to seem contrary, but when I open my iPhone, there's like six or eight Ubers anywhere. Any, how, how is that unreliable? So a couple of ways. Number one is uh, the timing on them. If these people have to get to these appointments and you're depending on basically addicted people to be to an appointment by a certain time, mm -hmm. but the Uber can't get there until a certain time, number, number two, who's going to pay for the Uber? Well, that's, that's what I thought we had money for, like cards. Like, like I know of a clinic in town here that gives cards out so people can make the appointment yeah, so through for, a grant. So why can't we do that here? So for us, what we are doing with our transportation system is we've worked with ECAT. They have vehicles that are available. Mm -hmm. We're hiring two drivers that are EMT <laughs> drivers. They will be the ones picking these people up, taking them to and from their appointments. That's fantastic, but that sounds very expensive compared to a $10 Uber card or a $20 Uber card. So the, the staff members are covered by the state funding. The vehicles are surplus free from ECAT. Okay. The fuel we've we put into our budget, and should that fall apart, that we don't have future funding as we discussed, mm -hmm. those positions are already going to fall under the umbrella of the additional FTEs sure. that I discussed gotcha. earlier. So, so, I mean, we've made sure there's a system of checks and balances so we don't okay. set ourselves up for failure. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I won't, I'll try not to ask you more questions, but I'm... The questions are important, Mr. Chair. That's what, We want to make sure we're answering what it is you, want, you, you need to know about this program or things you may be uncertain of. Okay. Um, at, at the end of the day for us, that middle component that I discussed, the, the, the community paramedicine, the follow through, each staff member from the next step, seeing the patient before they get to that step with that warm handoff, as I've mentioned, uh, is extremely important to make to ensure their success in this process. Palm Beach County has been doing this since 2018. Uh, I can't give you the exact number because it was it was low 80 percentile, like 83.5. I want to say is the number we were given uh, from Houston Park. He is a retired captain with Palm Beach County Fire Rescue and the one that uh, initiated their program down there. That is their retention rate with the people who have entered into this program that's being done down there, a little different version. They have some different resources that we don't into the program that are still in this program long term today to make sure they don't go back to the 83 percent yes 83.5 percent retention rate which is fantastic that's, that's amazing clay county is doing something similar they're doing what is the medication assisted therapy that that we are going to be doing here um, our community paramedicine program once the physician staff give that initial dose of medication do their assessment and get them into it our staff will be meeting them wherever they are in the field and giving them those subsequent doses to get through every day with an assessment until they go to the FQHC for long-term care. Now, the backside of that is they're gonna get holistic treatment there. They're gonna get drug addiction therapy, 
they're going to get whatever other services they we may have identified in the induction process that they need that wasn't available to them and they're going to have the availability to get the mental health therapy that commissioner barry talked about yes with that as they're under that umbrella and slowly gain success their professional staff will determine you know what they're ready for a prescription of medication now for 30 days we don't have to see them every day or every other day or once a week that's where our staff is going to come back and do the follow-up in the field just because you've been given a little leeway to perform and show that you're, you're getting it and you're, you're successful in the program, we want to make sure we're still following up with our community paramedicine on the back end. How's things? How's your appointment? How are you feeling with the medication? Are there any other needs you have? Because those small things that seem to be just minute to some people are extremely important to the success of these people in this program. Absolutely. Well, two, two things. What more do you need from this board specifically? And number two, is this starting now or is it starting in one month or when? I mean, when does this whole thing kick off that we're talking about? So our projected time right now that we're looking for, uh, it, it all depends on the deposits that come from the state. Obviously, as a county entity, I will need to come before the board to ask for the funds. Um, quarterly data and possibly with EMS and the FQHC because we're so busy, we're looking at possibly monthly data. Okay. However, we provide the data to them is the same interval that they will be providing the funding to us. So, you know, this month we give them the data, they make, they, they make a deposit uh, for the EMS services funding. What my question will be is I'm gonna have to bring this before the board for approval to receive this. Mm -hmm. Will we need to do it each time there is an interval or can we have an agreement that says, here's the interval, the funding will be received, you know, here's the layout and do it as one submission. That is something that I'm not sure. I think Stefan might want it to be brought forward just to kind of keep it, I don't know. Whatever. And if we do that, that's fine. It'll be easy enough to put forth on, on, on each one that's, that we have no problem with that. Um, but that's just, that's really from the EMS standpoint as the only county-based entity. You know, they, they can receive their funding as soon as they're ready, they're, they're gonna get it. I still need to come before you to ask permission to receive it. Mm -hmm. The state um, is also looking for, like we just procured a vehicle for the community paramedicine program. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna give us the direct deposit to cover that and for us to, to bring on the staff for the community paramedicine program. The two biggest sources uh, of needs of funding for this program were the FQHC and EMS, because it's all about staffing. Yep. Additional staff for the FQHC with mental health professionals, et cetera, uh, a health navigator at the hospital. Uh, one of the three hospitals didn't have one, so now all three will. And of course, our staff for community paramedicine and our drivers. Um, we are gonna be hiring staff that are both trained in both as paramedics and registered nurses. Um, we've already got the job descriptions in the county for registered nurses, so that's an easy transition. Um, and we believe both of those backgrounds are essential. There's several other community paramedicine programs in the state that utilize registered nurses that have a portion of a background that paramedics don't that will kind of bring that whole program together, especially for this when it relates to the initiated in a hospital. Well, I, I, it all sounds fantastic to me. Again, I, I, I want, I'm an all of the above approach kind of person, I want to be pragmatic about it. And I would just simply say that if you can interface with the IT department, I think that the public at large, um, this is a significant investment in taxpayer money, I think the public at large would be interested in the metrics in real time as well, so that we could see and, and you know, we're, we're gonna keep the EMS with the, the number of overdoses we respond to, but if we could develop a dashboard, kind of like what Wes did for the homeless beds available, that would show, hey, the number of patients in the program, um, you know, that way we could see the forward incremental progress but also that way we can see if the trends are not going in our direction. The thing that worries me is we spend the money, we make the investment, we take everyone's time, and a year from now, you know, what if the problem hasn't gotten better? You know, what if it got worse? I mean, I, so we, data is, like you said, data is gonna be critical, but if, is that something you could do with the IT department? Is that something you can work with in the grant so that the citizen could go to myescambi.com and, and see where their money uh, for this problem in action and is it making a difference? Sure, as, as far as data goes, we, we can provide, and it would have to be in coordination with the same data we're providing to the state. Yeah. Uh, Cause I mean, you know as well as I do, there's- Yeah, put it in the format, the easiest yeah, format yeah, yeah, for you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we wanna make sure that everything matches up so there's no questionability as to, well, where did this number come from and why is it presented in this way? We wanna make sure it's easy to understand by those, uh, just, just for formalities uh, okay. sake. But uh, we're looking at potentially probably the end of October, depending on when the when the funding is to start to start. Um, I know that, you know, in talking with Dr. Stavros on a meeting we had the other day by teams, he was actually going back and forth between the meeting and the ER mm -hmm. doing an induction process at that moment. Wow. So wow. we can't get this up and running fast enough to, to do this for these people. Is there anything we can do, anything the board can do to speed it up? 
Uh, the only thing is, is once this comes through from the Department of Health and once those funding sources are secured and we're ready to receive the monies, at least as far as EMS goes, mm -hmm. I will get it on the quickest agenda that I can to bring okay. before you for approval and any explanations required I can certainly right. give to you. So. What else you got for us? Uh, you know, that, that was it. I, I want to make sure that because um, the, there was a concern that was brought up earlier and I want to make sure Dr. Stavros can answer this. Please. The, the part about the you just trade one addiction for another. Yeah, absolutely. I'd that, love to that's hear been that. going around, and, and I would love for him to speak on behalf Please. of that. Yeah, yeah. that would be Dr. Awesome. Stavros, thank yeah, you. Absolutely. So, obviously, with the medications that are used, there's three FDA approved medications that we can use. The one that's most ideal in this setting would be Suboxone, buprenorphine. Getting patients on this medication, it's a daily medication. And let me, let me explain because this came up a little bit earlier about, you know, why are these people that are in jail or they've gone through treatment programs and they get out and the first thing they do is they use drugs and they overdose and die because that's cravings. So they're not going through withdrawals anymore. The withdrawals are gone. They've survived that part of it, but the cravings persist. And I know Commissioner May and I actually did a little video about doing some treatment in, in the jail system. There's like 120 times higher likelihood that somebody's going to leave jail in the first two weeks and overdose and die. Mm. It's like, well, they haven't even been around it for like six months or to a year. How is this possible? Because the brain has changed. There's cravings there. And I have a good friend of mine that had an addiction problem. He goes, let me explain to you what cravings are like. <laughs> Think about you holding yourself, you know, somebody's holding you under the water and suddenly you have air hunger and you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to drown, right? I have so much air hunger. It's pretty much I'm going to do anything I can to get out of the water. I will hurt you to get out of the water. Those are the kind of cravings you feel. I have to use. My brain's telling me to use no matter what because it's life or death. That's what my brain's telling you. And, and from us from the outside, we're like, that's crazy. How could they be thinking that way? But that's how they're seeing it in their brain. These medications, once they get on board, they stop the cravings. They stop the withdrawals if there were withdrawals. So they're not going to be dope sick. They're not going to be seeking drugs. If they're having, they're going to have decreased cravings. If they were to have any relapse, let's say, and they got into some medication or maybe they got into fentanyl, they're not overdosing from it as well. It's protective as well. Interesting. I yeah. Didn't know so that. it's very helpful from that standpoint. Let me ask you, are you interfacing with our uh, chief uh, of the jail so that when we have folks who perhaps uh, have this predisposition, I'll use that word, and they're on their way out of jail, um, you can provide those services. Are we, are we interfacing there? Um, because if not, we need to, um, just based on that chilling statistic, you, you said, what was that again? Within two weeks of leaving jail, if they're, if they're addicted, they, if have, they a, have an opiate addiction. There's 120 times higher likelihood of overdose death yeah. for that population in the first two weeks after. I mean, and of course it would be voluntary, but I mean, if you, t you know, I don't know, is that something that, that could help? Is that something that is currently happening? It may be happening. I'm not sure, but are you aware if it is? Yeah, we actually have a program right now where we are evaluating patients that choose they want to get treatment. So on the way out of jail. On the way out. We try to actually start medication. We're using the medication called naltrexone or Vivitrol right now in the jail system. We try to get that to the patient before they leave jail. Because to my point, if they leave jail and they go back to people, places, and things like we've talked about, right. their chances of using again goes up higher. But if this medication is on board, this is a block. It's a different type of medication, but it blocks the opiates. So even if they were to have that relapse, they're not going to overdose and die from it. So. That's interesting. That's great to know. Thank you for that. One last comment. So yes, sir. I'm the medical director at HCA Florida West. I've been there for about 20 years. I want to give you my cell phone number. If you guys ever have any questions at all, I am passionate about this. I want this problem to go away. And anything I can do to help educate, I'm happy to do that too. Now, you're not going to announce it, but you'll email it to us, right? We don't Absolutely. want everyone calling right. you. Because <laughs> right, they will, believe me. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, but yeah, if you don't mind, uh, can you forward his yes, sir. number along with this PowerPoint slide? I just appreciate you all being here. Was there anyone from the panel that would like to speak to the board or anything? Mr. Chairman, to... yeah. before Dr. Stavros yeah. leaves, if you don't mind. Yeah, she, please. To uh, say hello, nice to see you again. I want to uh, recognize the facility on Nine Mile Road. It's uh, y'all's urgent care there uh, with the ER is going very well. I just want to tell you I appreciate the, you know, appreciate the uh, additional access for my constituency, and I know Absolutely. it's being I know it's being utilized greatly. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, anyone from the panel? Uh, any any input? Chandra. Chandra. Well, yes. I, I just want to say that you were talking about the cost of the Suboxone, the medication. Yes. Part of this partnership in being a federally qualified health center is we're able to use our 340B pricing to bring that down. Yeah, I heard it's so, like 30 bucks a dose. Yes. So I just want to, you know, make sure that you guys are aware that we're. So who? Charge. So if it's an if it's someone who has the means to pay and he comes to the program, it's going to be free, or is there going to be a sliding charge scale? Well, as a patient, 
yes, of, patient. of our organization, yeah. um, all of our sliding fee and compensated care programs would apply as well. Mr. So Chairman. if they had no insurance, they would be put on our sliding fee scale and okay. You know, so, so if they're addicted, they would still have to pay. If they have a seventy-five thousand dollars job, but they just can't kick it, they'd have to pay you something to get this treatment. Well, I mean, based on if they have no insurance, mm -hmm. um, and based on their income, mm -hmm. um, just our federal sliding fee program, which most of our patients pay five dollars or no or nothing. Yes, ma'am. Um, they would be placed on that fee accordingly, and then if they have limited access to even purchasing the medications, then we have programs through our pharmaceutical. Um, you know, programs in our pharmacies to help offset those yes, costs. Yes, ma'am. Thank so. you for that clarification. Yes, Sandra. So you referenced that pricing. Would <clears throat> is that pricing schedule? I mean, is that a lower pricing schedule than the county has access to? Yeah. Yes. As a federally qualified health center and a covered entity, yes. any of the medications that are on the 340B program, which Suboxone is, we would be able to purchase at a much are, lower rate. Are there any other medications that the county utilizes, whether it's EMS or especially in our corrections facility yes. that we could utilize off this? Because we spend millions of we dollars a year fortunes. currently through. S St Steve, Miss Malley and I spent a little time uh, at the jail the last couple of weeks, and I think that is a... A, a real conversation of millions of dollars that can be saved from the 340B, but I'll, I mean, I'll let we, her explain. You know, we utilize a, a couple of, uh, a couple of, I don't know, piggyback contracts. I mean, I want to say one is something that was procured through University of Minnesota or something like that, or Minnesota, Minnesota materials or something. Yeah. You know, we've, and over the years, over the last eight years or nine years, we've utilized some different cooperative purchasing contracts. But if we can, you know, as, I mean, and it's a, it's not as if it's a, um, you know, a thinly, you know, put together partnership. I and mean, we, we are a funding partner with you and anything that we're purchasing, if it's one of those, if it's off of any of those schedules, if, uh, if we could make some comparisons between, you know, I see the invoices or the purchase orders for, you know, the aggregate dollars or gross amounts. I mean, I don't necessarily see the, you know, so many doses of this or however they sell milliliters of this. But if we could run a real comparison, of, especially out of public safety, Eric and um, Wes, if you would get rich on it or have somebody, Donna or somebody over there that can run, you know, not just the vendor, but the actual detailed, detailed list of what we've paid for what drugs. If there's any cross reference there, it would be greatly appreciated. So for the for the 340B discount, it's a highly regulated program <laughs> through HRSA, sure. and so there are certain requirements that have to be met in order for the patient to qualify. But we could certainly sit down and look at if there is some way that we could um, partner. But but in order for 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 example, in this program, the patient has to be established as a patient of the federally qualified health center, served at a location that is designated by HRSA as a site, in order for those benefits to extend. Well, I would and expect so, that many of our inmates are patients of yours because of you know many lack health insurance. I mean, mm -hmm. I I think that's a given. Many lack health you know adequate health insurance and. Um, maybe that's one of the things that we need to do is have our correction facility designated as a designated as one of those sites if that's if that's a possibility I mean if there's some red tape to jump through yeah. we should be able to we should be able to navigate that if uh, if that's one of the thresholds yeah miss Miley I mean I, I, I think she's taking a, a, a dive at it but not necessarily the deeper dive but I think the 340b and miss Miley you can correct me if necessary would be part of kind of what Jeff was talking about the over all medical of health and you know and one of the good things Steve as you've just indicated uh, many of the patients uh, at community health are well the majority of our patients from the jail are the patients of commun community health and we talk about the reduction of recidivism and, and, and maintaining uh, monitoring health uh, it's important to have that partner in I don't think it will be you know just a a purchase partnership but an overall um, encompassing strategy of how we handle health, mental health in the jail. So how many sites do you have in Escambia County? Half dozen uh, that, you, that are uh, in actual? A, in a, we have 19 sites in total and 17 are, in, are throughout Escambia. Okay, so we've got 17 sites. So, But the correctional facility currently is not, one, is not no. a site. I think that 
if that's an absolute black and white that would be required, maybe that's one of the first things we do is try to figure out how to, how to, how to have that qualify as a potential site. Uh, it would seem very reasonable just because of the population. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Commissioner Baird, to perhaps answer a question as far as it pertains to public safety. So the reason we are able to get the 340B FQHC pricing for this particular drug is because our paramedics are going to be under the umbrella of the FQHC when they administer it. It will be coming from their pharmacies and they will be the ones stocking it. So for this program, we are eligible for that $30 a month price. However, for, for the other drugs that we carry in the field, you know, epinephrine, everything else that we would give for emergency services, those would be for 911 calls that do not fall underneath the umbrella of uh, the FQHC, and we would not be able to get those medications reimbursed at that price. Now, there are state contracts, of course, as you know, um, and the state is working on a contracted price right now for an agency like mine to be able to order from my supplier at the state contracted rate without having to go through the FQHC, but they said they're about 90 to 120 days away from that negotiations actually coming to fruition. So mm. j just some information to perhaps help with that process. Doug and then Lumen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, actually, this question is probably uh, more appropriate for Stefan. If Stefan, if you uh, could, where are we at? So the 1.4 million is requested. Is it awarded when and wh where are we at in that process exactly? So the, the total uh, amount of funds is between all of the facilities. Uh, each of the hospital organizations are going to get about 100,000. There's a, the remaining portion, which goes between EMS and the FQHC, which was split between uh, 700 and some thousand between EMS and about 400 and some thousand to uh, the FQHC, uh, which is for the staffing, solely for staffing. No. Uh, we're still waiting. Marie, um, you want to you come up and talk about? Marie has been working as the, uh, the point of contact for the funding source as how it's distributed between all of our parties on the team. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the grant funding is coming from the Florida Department of Health directly out to the entities, and they're going through a purchasing process right now for that, um, developing the statements of work and pushing that through purchasing. And so I actually should have possibly hear something today on, on an update on that um, when that's coming out. Um, but it could be at any, at any time now, actually, so. Okay, um, the reason I bring it up is that uh, earlier on in the discussion, uh, sir, you had mentioned that, you know, that as soon as the money is available that you'd be on the next agenda and that kind of thing. Um, if at the point where we are guaranteed that this money is coming to Escambia County, um, you know, I personally, and I think probably my peers would as well, be very receptive to you know, working with Stefan and whatever is necessary to uh, uh, front it out of reserves, uh, since we know it's guaranteed cash that's coming back to us. Uh, the problem's not going to be any better tomorrow than it is today. Yes, sir. Right? So uh, those mechanisms that we have uh, within his shop and within with the uh, administrator uh, that would be able to accelerate um, the funding, getting it onto the street. Um, you know, you should, you should not delay in, in uh, taking advantage of those opportunities. I think you, that would be well received by this board. Outstanding, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Lumen? No. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, your passion, and for all the folks from the hospitals and the agencies. We really appreciate your help. I know it's a tough issue and some of the questions might seem sharp, um, but we get these questions when we're shopping and when we're out in town. Believe me, we get beat up a lot, so we have to ask tough questions when y'all are here. Appreciate y'all being here. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I do with you, all of our healthcare partners and particularly community health and HTA and Baptist and Sacred, we appreciate your time and concern for our community. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, Wes, what do we got next? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. We, we do have on the agenda a presentation uh, about minority procurement. Yeah. I've had some communication with Mr. Wire, and I, you know, at the last minute gave him some more questions uh, to get some clarification. I know that Commissioner Barry needs to go, and I don't think we're going to be able to get all this done by 1030. So would you mind if we push it to uh, another committee or the whole? Because there's some questions that I Yeah, have, absolutely, I have. guys. Yeah, no, yeah, we're not going to, yeah, we don't need to push it. Brian, can you come back at our next committee the whole? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm sorry to. we ran long, but that, 
I mean, people, you know, that's a Brian, you were going to be awesome. I mean, we know you were going to be epic. We know that. <laughs> well, I will give you I have, have a few minutes to get a few, few updates real fast. You, you have got nine minutes apparently. Okay, real quick. Um, one of the things I did forward to your, your email was a, a document about the draft metrics that we have out there. Yes, sir. One of the challenges we have is that the Census Bureau and also the Office of Power Diversity has changed their formatting. Some of the baselines I created back in 2018 19 are not, no longer quite relevant. Mm -hmm. So when I show you the information, it may look a little different. I also forwarded this to you a document with the procurement uh, assessment that was done back in July 2020. That was a $175,000 assessment that was done for the procurement department and uh, basically said that we need additional people in place, additional software in place. So what did we spend in 2020 on, on, on minority vendors? Uh, I, I, you have that number? Yeah, that's it, why. That's why yeah. it's, it's not really ready for me at this point. Yeah, I, I just wanted to just yeah. let you know about, about the actual documents. I did forward you through your email. The fact that uh, they're there just to kind of explain some details, and later we can go over more details with the committee as a whole. I appreciate you being here. And again, sorry to keep you waiting all day. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Sorry. No, I got some Brand good work done. It was, I, I like it. It was good, productive time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, all right. Um, uh, yes, I, I do Robert. have something I would like to just discuss real quick um, with uh, not not with you. Oh, okay. Um, Thanks, Brian. Thanks. So. Um, with regard to any permits that have been pulled by banks in the cost, I was wondering if we could waive the fees to repermit uh, for those people that have been taken advantage of. So these are people that need to have another inspection done, something no like problem. this. I know we don't meet for two weeks, but um, I've, I've talked with Allison some, and we want to put some parameters around it. Again, these would only be for permits that have been pulled by uh, banks in the cost for those people that 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 need to, to change the permit or something like that. What happened yesterday, Allison? I mean, was there any? Any decisions made yesterday? There were several fines that were assessed. It was a very long meeting. It went more than four hours. Um, there was more than $25,000 in fines that were assessed against banks, and Lacoste separately had some um, hearings as well. So it was. Have they worked through the backlog of complaints? I believe Good there's question. another meeting at the end of next week. Okay. But where are we on complaints? Have we gotten through all of them that people filed and investigated them? I think you'd have to ask Ms. Hampton. I don't know the answer to that. Right. And for what Robert mentioned, I mean, we've done it after hurricanes or ice storms or floods or what have you. So that's, I mean, if we're just giving that direction today, I mean, I, I, it, it is an enterprise fund. I've talked to Stefan. So what yeah. we will come back on the 22nd with that's the resolution fine. to memorialize it. Yeah. yeah. I, There's no, that's I don't that's think great. anybody, anybody yeah. has an Thank issue you. with that. Good Do idea. you know, Wes, have they worked through the backlog? I don't know if they've gotten completely to the backlog. I know they, they've added some meetings, so they'll be having weekly meetings there in a couple throughout September and, and moving into October. So I, know, I do know they are uh, adding meetings and, and trying to expedite uh, the complaints. As Allison said, it was a four-hour meeting, and uh, it was, it's a process. There, the next special meeting of the Contractor Competency Board is on September the 20th, and they are scheduling additional special meetings to work through their backlog. Fantastic. Very good. All right. Anything else? We're adjourned. <laughs>